Now I would like to invite um, Robert Volterra and I briefly introduce him, although he doesn't need really an introduction. He is a um, partner of Volterra Fieta, a dedicated public international law firm. He teaches international boundary disputes and international foreign investment law as visiting professor at University College London and as visiting senior lecturer at King's College London. He advises and represents governments, international organizations, and private clients on a wide range of public international law issues. And he has advised and represented small states in the Americas, Africa, Europe, and Asia, including the Caribbean and the Pacific regions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, everything has been so interesting uh, today. I've enjoyed this so much. My, my congratulations uh, to the organizers for having conceived of, of such an interesting topic and, and getting such a, an illustrious group of, of, of speakers and thinkers on the topic to come in. And I am delighted and honored to be wrapping up the day today. Um, <clears throat> I note the time and I'm the last thing between you and cocktails and then dinner, so I will be mindful of that. And I will uh, chain my manacle my, my wrists to the mast like uh, we've been told we should, as Ulysses did. Um, I, uh, I was asked to synthesize and, uh, and analyze some of the themes that have arisen today and to add my observations and analysis and to set the stage for tomorrow, which will focus largely on dispute resolution, and that's uh, what I will uh, intend to do. Um, uh, looking at the time now and, and how it's, uh, it's run a bit later than we thought reminds me of uh, one of the first conferences I ever went as a younger lawyer. It was to an ICA conference, which is a, sort of a commercial arbitration conference. It was here in London. It's a really big deal for people who do commercial arbitration, which I, 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 I don't, it's not really my focus, but I, I, I went to this anyway because my boss, Jan Paulsen, uh, who was uh, the world's leading uh, commercial arbitration lawyer at the time, was uh, the co-president of this ICA London, along with a man called Arthur Marriott, who was a real character. And uh, they both were giving a 15-minute presentation at the, at the opening cocktail party launch. And uh, Arthur Marriott uh, was uh, very jealous of Jan Paulson, didn't like him very much. So he spoke for about 25 minutes, welcoming everybody to London. Uh, and then he said at the very end that um, just before the start of the program, uh, he and Jan Paulson and someone else had been chatting and that um, uh, uh, Jan Paulson had promised that he would give his welcoming address telling everything that the visitors to London needed to know in no more than five words and that this other person had said Jan couldn't do it, he wasn't up to it, but he, Arthur Marriott, was sure he was and here you go Jan, your turn's up. So Jan approached the podium thinking about what to do, and um, he said, look left crossing the street. <laughs> and the room collapsed uh, in uproarious laughter. The drinks started and everybody wanted to shake Jan's hand and Arthur was alone in a corner. So uh, I hope uh, that I will not be alone in the corner, uh, but instead uh, I, I will be surrounded by people having drinks and shaking my hand, so I'm going to keep things quite brief. And I, too, am going to uh, reduce my uh, conclusion to uh, five words. Well, okay, I've lied already. Not five words, but five ideas. And I'm going to list them and then explain them. Uh, the five ideas are uh, trying to encapsulate what we've heard today, what we're probably going to hear tomorrow, and what I, as someone who practices public international every day and deals with governments every day, including many small governments, would view as the key to uh, small states uh, facing the reality of their context in uh, the international community and striving to achieve with success an optimal outcome for themselves. These are the five things. There's, there's, there's nothing special about them. The first and foremost is the rule of law. And you've heard that repeatedly today in, in different ways, overtly and, and indirectly, the rule of law, both internally, but taking that internal commitment to and realization of the rule of law internationally to regions and then more globally. Law constrains power. It's as simple as that. Now, law can also be abusive and assist power, and law often does both at the same time. 
But law has the ability to constrain power. And so attempting to shape law, but to reinforce and support and promote the concept of the rule of law, not just domestically, but regionally and internationally, must be the cornerstone of the small state, of the less powerful state. It has to be essentially like the human rights of smaller states. The second thing is the advantage in numbers. You've heard many speakers speak today about how there are regional organizations. We all know that. There are many regional organizations. There's been a lot of focus on, on the Caribbean and, and the South Pacific, and rightly so. But there is advantage in numbers. There is strength in numbers. And if we're completely politically incorrect, we'll all admit that a state with 50,000 people living in it and a low GDP and no natural resources is not going to get as many telephone calls answered by the President of the United States of America as a country that is more powerful, more populous, has more natural resources and so on. So how can that be overcome? Well, collectivization, and we've seen examples in the Caribbean, we've seen examples in the South Pacific. I would say, in, in, from what I can tell, the Caribbean is a bit more advanced in that respect than South Pacific, and one hopes that the South Pacific region keeps growing, keeps uh, taking advantage of that strength, which it seems to be. Of course, it's, a, it's not something that happens overnight, but the, the various South Pacific institutions are strengthening, and it's good to see. It was good to see them um, through the office of the chief trade negotiator uh, having collective positions with Australia in particular uh, and New Zealand in certain respects. Um, and the Caribbean, you know, the, 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 the CARICOM group, uh, they know that when there's the General Assembly of the Organization of American States, that if they, if they act together collectively, they'll get half an hour with the Secretary of State of the United States of America. So if they, if they get together and they agree amongst themselves, what are the two issues we want to put in front of her or him? What are, what, what are, what are the positions we want to take? They can do so and they can get time and, and, and through their collectivity have a chance to achieve a, a, a more effective result. And it, it may be that um, merely regional collectivities for small states is not the way forward. Perhaps more conceptual collectivities that are not limited to, to geography should be considered as well. What about small states that have um, uh, fishing issues? You know, they're, they're not constrained to the South Pacific or the Caribbean or anything like that. Uh, when I was doing the ICJ case for Colombia against Nicaragua, the San Andres and Providencia Islanders have limited um, cultural uh, links with the mainland of Colombia and far greater links with the English-speaking Caribbean around them. Cultural, uh, economic, linguistic. There, there are ways that collectivities and, and taking advantages of numbers can be achieved. The third thing is multilateralization multilateralized relations with powerful states. The first country to do this successfully should be the poster child for every country that thinks of itself, conceives of itself as less powerful, and that's Canada, my country. Canada, during its deep thinking during the Second World War with its brilliant foreign minister, Lester Pearson, realized that the protections of the British Empire would be no more after the war. There would be no imperial tariff system. The British would no longer be able to uh, uh, protect their empire, even their non-empire, uh, which was at that point South Africa, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, but part of the dominions. And it was next to the giant. And it wasn't going anywhere quickly. So what to do to constrain power? Well, Canada conceived of the concept of multi multilateralism. They created it. So when the United States wanted to have a, a, to keep the military alliance of the Allies during the Second World War in place in Europe to confront Russia, Canada insisted that this NATO organization should have a political parliament. Most people don't realize that NATO has a parliament. 
because Canada pushed for it. Because Canada realized as a small country dealing with the superpower next door, it was, gonna, it was never going to win. But if it multilateralized relationships, it could open the dialogue. It could seek to build partnerships, uh, either on issues or more generally. And of course, compared to some countries in the Caribbean or South Pacific or countries that are 1.5 million defined as small states, Canada is much bigger. But in relative terms, power and lack of power is a relational thing. It's, it, it is always relative, as we know. So small states, multilateral relationships, mul multilateralized relationships with powerful states, exactly like the, the South Pacific countries did in the trade negotiations with, with Australia and New Zealand. Fourth, and this is something you're going to hear about tomorrow, leverage the power of the neutrality of international courts and tribunals. Implementing and seeking to implement concepts of the rule of law through, through, through international courts and tribunals is a remarkably empowering thing for small states. As it's on the public record, I, I was the co-agent and, and uh, lead counsel for Bay Barbados in its, in its um, maritime delimitation dispute against Trinidad and Tobago. And, uh, and David Berry was part of the legal team, and one of my former associates, Stephen Fiera, is going to be talking tomorrow. Uh, and he might mention this case. It was an important case between two countries that may fit the definition, broadly speaking, of small states. But in relative terms, Barbados was still an extremely small state as, as compared to Trinidad and Tobago in terms of economic size, in terms of population. Enormous differentials. Enormous enormous differentials. So that was small states within small states. And it couldn't confront Trinidad and Tobago politically beyond a certain point. It couldn't confront Trinidad and Tobago economically. It was vulnerable because its fishing populations could be subjected to the control of Trinidad unilaterally. And Trinidad didn't really have domestic fishing populations. It had licensed out all its fishing rights to uh, South Korean or Taiwanese uh, industrial boats. Barbados went and set up the first Annex 7 Maritime Delimitation UNCLOS Tribunal and won, largely won. We're very happy. Whatever you could say the outcome was, they redressed the, the imbalance using the leverage of the rule of law and an international court and tribunal. And you can see that over and over and over again. Timor-Leste against Australia. Uh, Djibouti against France at the ICJ. Um, Nauru, Australia. Uh, Mauritius has just taken the UK to, uh, to, to litigation. Increasingly, small states are realizing that they can achieve, they can redress somewhat the imbalance of power, of pure, raw power, that exists in the international community by the rule of law and the recourse to international courts and tribunals. I was the lawyer for Antigua and Barbuda that brought the case against the United States and the WTO. Talk about David and Goliath. It was the first time the WTO allowed external lawyers outside of government to bring a case or to, to, to act in a case before the dispute resolution provisions. Why did they do so? The United States has hundreds of lawyers in the government who are specialized in international dispute resolution, or specialized in, in trade law, and so on. Antigua and Barbuda might have had a few dozen lawyers in the whole island. If Montserrat has a dispute, and there are a thousand people in Montserrat, how can they have the resources indigenously to uh, have a bit of a level playing field in this enormous potential of, of international dispute re resolution before an international court and tribunal. Good lawyers are expensive. Experienced lawyers are expensive. I am expensive. That's the market. Why? Because lawyers like me, lawyers like many people in this room, like David Berry, uh, like, uh, like Dr. Remy, like people at Wilmer Hale, are very specialized in what we do. We achieve results, and people will pay for us. So what can a, 
a small state do? Well, a small state is still a state. A small state is an entity that has chosen to be part of the club of nations. That club has rules and obligations. And they cannot be avoided. There's a fantastic um, saying of the Assiniboine uh, native peoples uh, from back in Canada. And they live in the subarctic area mostly. And obviously there's a lot of snow most of the time. And they use dog sleds to go around. And their saying is, obviously in relation to a husky dog, if you want to run with the big dogs, you cannot piss like a puppy. That's hard message. That's a hard message. But if you look at the International Court of Justice record, forget about small state, big state, and you look at which, which states in any of the contentious pleadings in the last 20 years has hired a law firm and which has not hired a law firm and which state has won, every single time that there's been a state that has a law firm and the other state has a bunch of law professors, the state with the law firm wins. It's, this isn't rocket science. So what do small states need to do? They want to run with the dogs? They got to be a dog. They got to find a way to get the right lawyers, the right economists, the right international relations people, or at least sufficient to redress the imbalance. That's the reality of being a small state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and experience uh, in your concluding remarks. I'm sure there's plenty of time for discussion uh, during the reception. Please join me again in thanking everyone today, all the participants, all the speakers for their excellent contributions and please join us for the reception. Thank you very much. <laughs>